As um, Dr. Yusuf uh, Baba Ahmed said uh, earlier, some of the biggest ideas are the simplest. You know, I, I remember in um, the tech space, you know, rice cookers are very important to Japanese. You know, so to compete, companies just kept adding one new thing to a rice cooker. The one that will tell you the rice has started cooking, is about to go to this level. The one that will sing, the one that will do. It got so complex, Japanese women were beginning to be afraid of a rice cooker. <laughs> Until Sharp invented a plain rice cooker with no frills, nothing, and it's, it exploded in terms of sales. Mm -hmm. So the simple ideas sometimes are the biggest big ideas. But one big idea we cannot run away from and we'll take on. I hope uh, uh, Daniel is ready. I talked earlier about Servicom, uh, the policy delivery unit. Big problem in our country is that left hand does not know what right hand. Nobody's coordinating them. Nobody's insisting that the goal is in front of them and measuring and holding people to account. And we have thought through in the process of developing the um, that he, uh, be that he, uh, manifesto an implementation grid, how we can have a special a policy delivery unit in the presidency that will make sure that the states are coordinated with the center and the various agencies in a seamless manner that we don't have the kind of confusion we have in the power sector today. Uh, amongst those we've chatted on these issues with is somebody who is actually, um, uh, incidentally I mentioned Palladium and, and the work that I had done on the power sector previously. Somebody worked with me on it back then, now works for Tony Blair and his country uh, lead for Tony Blair's policy review unit initiatives in Malawi, Daniel Ikonobe. Uh, uh, Daniel, are you there? Uh, is Daniel there? I'm here. Oh, you're, you're there, Daniel. Okay. okay, Daniel, just in brief, because we have very short time. In brief, how can we use the concept of a policy delivery unit in the presidency to ensure effective implementation under the new order in Nigeria if we can take back our country and we must. Great. Thank you, Prof. Um, if you think about it with wedding and wedding analogy, people spend so much time preparing for a wedding and so little time preparing for a marriage. Um, and like somebody once said, that it's easier to win an election than to run a government. And what we have found in many clients is that there are very many well-meaning politicians who say, you know, we are going to deliver the country and become a running point for the entire, for the entire country. People place their hopes on them. And then they get in and realize that it's not as easy as they thought. And we find that having a delivery unit or begin to think about delivery before you, you know, the moment you announce is a very powerful and in a useful, useful way to approach um, how to run government. And I'll just put a few thoughts ar around that. One is that I'll bring into three, three buckets. The first is the leadership. There must be a very strong, very strong leadership signal. Because all that the leader can do, in this case, if in the case of um, the Labour Party, all that the leader can do in person of Peter Obi is to, to represent and embody you know, that very strong signal to say, these are my priorities. This is how I play my politics. This is, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of initiatives that I'm interested in and be very consistent with that. And then in terms of that signaling, who he sees, what he says, where he goes, must also reinforce the signal. Again, his choice of cabinet will also send a signal, intended or unintended. You know, those kinds of interactions and all that, we have to be very, you know, focused on the kind of signal that the leader sends. Then you then have a strong coordinating center, and this is what we speak to the delivery unit, that is like a SWAT team of experts that are able to take those priorities, build plans around it, begin to engage with key stakeholders and bring them together. And we're talking about MDA coordination, some national coordination, 
private sector coordination, you know, door coordination, the coordination development partners, and ensure that there is an alignment of their plans, their budgets, their activities along the signal that the leader is spending. And then that is the second bit. Then the third bit is to ensure that the communication is clear, consistent, and coherent. From the leader signaling to the end to the, the what the MD is, you know, coordinated by this delivery unit is also aligned because the truth is there is an interesting oxymoron that delivery units don't deliver. And what it really means is that their activity is to help the government to, you know, show place the, you know, a very clear coherence in how the plans are done and how the activities are done and execution is done. So the rest of society, private sector and everyone else can then place their bets knowing that policies and actions of government are coherent and consistent. And so you we have that. So the first thing you need to do is identify a very strong leader, you know, that will head such a unit. That leader must be able to do two things. One, he must be able to leverage the, 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 the authority and conveying power of the president. That person must have that that de facto, you know, um, access to say I can I can leverage that both of that authority and his conveying power to engage the rest of society. That is one. Secondly, he must be able to interface very strongly and cause a seamless flow between the political and the bureaucratic, because he can stand on that platform of the bureaucracy and then you know never that that coordinating mechanism of the bureaucracy because. The institution is what remains, right? Uh, uh, you know, that there, he, he, he must build a framework that shows that there must be institutional ownership of the policies, priorities, and directions of the principal, right? Secondly, that he must, they must be able to start building huge collateral. For example, many MDAs in Nigeria will have the best policies in the world. Being able to get those policies and bring them together and align them and say, this is a, this is, clearly what we are trying to achieve and to say that we have strong collateral institutional memory must be built in across board and then lastly you want to ensure that that individual can strongly empower the fringes so, so basically a delivery unit is not one to, to saw the place or authority of the mdas but one that goes behind and acts as a facilitator as a facilitator in making those those, those things happen a number of tools that come to play in building a delivery unit is one, to use a very structured approach, albeit maybe the strategy management system or some sort on a national scale, where that you are able to take the national vision, build you know, an operating mechanism that allows to, to generate those activities that delivers on that, and then also the capabilities of the nation that drives that process to deliver that value ultimately. So having a very strong systemic process now, guiding the process and progress, guiding the activities and the outcomes and ensuring that those things are done in a very structured way. And maybe balance more cards on a national scale as if, if, if you will. The other tool which was which was driven by the initiative by um it was Jama who uh, led the Balation transformation um, is something you will be looking called labs. Labs is applying the rules of agile or an agile mindset or um, uh, an incubator. In, within the space of governance. And we using labs is a way to crash space and time in order to accelerate delivery. So basically what you do is to create like a war room and bring the key decision makers and action takers into a, space, a single space. Thereby, not it's not a workshop, it is not a talk shop. Here you are, there are delivery, you know, there are delivery rooms. So that, that is, you are you the point. Yes. We're going to create a war room. This yes. is what we need right now to rescue Nigeria. It is serious business. Our country is prostrate. We've got to turn things around that we might be able to create something that will be so phenomenal. History will never forget. Now, I know that you have got plenty to say on those tracks, but time is so, so, so against us. I want to take one or two uh, uh, other critical uh, big ideas areas. I've always said, people say corruption is so difficult, blah, 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 blah. I said, look at you people. Simple technology like blockchain technology, which allows everybody to see the same information at the same time, is enough cure for corruption. Corruption is based on the fact that there is information asymmetry. 
these information asymmetries, you know, this person does not know what this person knows, leads to the kind of um, uh, um, gaps. gaps. Yeah, gaps that people take advantage of. Discretion that they then use to extract money from poor people who are supposed to take these services. Uh, can I will speak to this and uh, perhaps a little bit about what you could do in the oil industry. You know, we're talking about all these thefts and stuff like that. Then we'll come back and I'll quickly summarize one or two other big ideas uh, and then we'll go to listen to the women whose empowerment can change our country. Because this country has talented women everywhere but people who put Nigeria down have not done enough to allow our talented women to take their pride of place in showing the way. Yes. Thank you, Prof. Mm. So, um, in, the, in the space of blockchain technology, there is a whole lot that can be done. I mean, we heard when Mr. Dati was speaking to the procurement process in Nigeria. So, I mean, with blockchain technology, there are a whole lot of transparency that can be created in that space for the oil and gas industry and every other sector that the business solely um, relies on supply chain and um, procurement. So even um, in Nigeria, as a country, we can actually use blockchain technology for um, our procurement processes in selecting um, suppliers, contractors for strategy selections, whether it's competitive or selective. Once a vendor or a contractor is delivering a job, there should be an appraisal system where they are being appraised. So whenever they want to do another job, it's just for the company to go to that portal and verify from the um, certificate of work completion that was given to the vendor for the previous job. So with this being on the blockchain network, it could be accessible by anybody. So vendors are giving projects and jobs based on um, capacity to deliver excellence. So I think the blockchain technology is what we need currently in Nigeria. Most especially, like Prof said, in the oil and gas industry. It could help also in hydrocarbon tracking. It could help in the upstream and downstream sector of the oil and, and, and gas industry. Petrol. Uh, and silly petrol. crude oil. Exactly. And <laughs> also um, stealing of the crude oil, stealing of hydrocarbon. I, you know, it, it just shocks me to no end, that we can actually have a bold face and say people are still in crude oil. As Peter B says, <laughs> it's not a gallon that you can put in your yes, system. Yeah, I mean. The whole shipload just leaving here and they say somebody stole crude oil. And they're stealing so heavily. In Saudi Arabia, they know exactly where what is on their pipeline. They exactly. can tell where every barrel, every drop of crude oil is. And here we're talking absolute nonsense because we, we, are, we are the real thieves. We, the government people, are the thieves. So we've got to stop this and serve our people. Anyway, uh, not enough time to deal with this. Let me just quickly summarize on, 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 on this, the two other big uh, uh, ideas that I wanted us to speak to. Uh, one of us at an airport trying to join us, but simple uh, idea, revenues. We're struggling with revenues, raising revenues. And some people say, ah, you see, we need to tax people more, uh, but people are not paying taxes. People even misunderstand the, if you will, a logic of taxation. Yes, many people are not paying taxes, but a few that are paying those taxes are even being overtaxed. You know, we don't really calculate when we think taxation. The European who's paying taxes, the American who's paying taxes, doesn't take care of an extended family. Doesn't do all these other things. And those are taxes on him or her. But just leave all of those aside. You can't invest if you are being overtaxed. And those who pay tax in Nigeria are being overtaxed. And our people are saying, oh, the problem of revenues is because we're not collecting enough taxes. It's in increasing how. You can incentivize the system using even insurance companies. Look, let's take... Uh, uh, but yeah, car insurance, it's compulsory. We're supposed to be, but people will pay anything like car insurance. Police, when they stop a car, the incentive is for them to take a bribe rather than to, to get the, the thing done. So 
Okay, it's a series of intense incentives. Everybody you get to pay, such an amount goes to the police fund. Such an amount goes to your salary being better. Before you know it, boom, revenues will flow in like crazy. We're just not using creativity to run this country. And you can go, let's go from revenues, let's go to um, a point that I like to make. And when I said it at the last, you can make everybody in this country literally a millionaire. I say, ah, you know, all this, uh, this kind of idea. Simple. The, the man who they said put 200 and something billion, took something away. It was a, the accountant. You get stories like that every day in newspaper. Just take those people and what they are supposed to have stolen. Collect all the money. Put it in 20 banks. Hmm? Those 20 banks. You have the BVN of every Nigerian. By the time you put those money, you will see that easily 3, 4 million naira can go to every Nigerian. Exactly. Pay it into their accounts. But don't go and collect it tomorrow. And they pay it into account. Your children are supposed to go to school, eh? This is the school fees. We take 300,000 from your account to pay school fees. Your children go to good schools. You are supposed to uh, do X, Y, Z. Pay this tax. We take it. Government takes it to use to run other services. By the time you finish, some guys may have 500,000 naira left. Some may have 100,000 left. It's their money. They can go and spend it anyhow. Now, this is actually a development on an idea that has been around for some time. I said the last time that in 2003, two Columbia University economists, Avin Subramanian and Javier Salai Matan, actually said that the government of Nigeria was so inefficient in the welfare that Nigerians derive from crude oil sales that Nigeria was better off without the government. That if Nigeria didn't have a government, you just wrote the checks. Mm. Say, oil sales is uh, whatever, $1 billion. And there uh, are 100 million Nigerians. Just statistical. Okay, everybody, you take your $1,000 or $2,000. That the welfare effect will be greater than the government is supposed to be making it more being in place. Okay. Um, um, as an economist at Harvard, a Norwegian, you know, Norway's fame for a sovereign wealth fund, blah, blah, blah. Then said, okay, maybe it might be slightly impractical to implement this Romanian Salai Martin thesis. But why don't you just say to every Nigerian, we have collected all these revenues from crude oil. Effectively, you are entitled to $10,000 each. But we won't give it to you because we are taxing you at the rate of 99.9%. .9%. And so here is the balance. That is your money. But we have collected tax on 99. People will go, what? Meaning all this is my money. Because right now people don't know it's their money. Yeah, exactly. They think it's government's money. <laughs> it's what he calls the endowment effect. Will get people to become so sensitive that government becomes more accountable. And that will add value to citizenship. So, all, right. all right, we still have the women waiting yes. um, as we begin to wrap the, the, big, the, the big idea. And those of you who are still listening to us who are online, the big idea, yes, I know that uh, some lay people like us will be thinking automobile plants, uh, intervention in agriculture and all that. But we're, we're also talking about low-hanging fruit, things that government can implement immediately and unlock prosperity and things will begin to happen. Uh, those are the things that we are looking at. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, t uh, take a little insert so that we can make the transition to the women. Uh, I, I will still have Prophet Pat here to link us up with that one. Uh, give us an insight. A small break. We'll come back and we'll, we'll do that.